fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCW 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery on KCAA, 106.5 FM, Los Angeles, 1050 AM, Palm Springs. I'm Al Warren, Mr. John Copenhaver, on the co-host duty today. How are you doing, John? I am splendid. I'm here in Richmond, Virginia. It's spring. Yeah, so, yeah, it's spring. But how can you be splendid? I've seen you've been doing all these book shows and all these events and stuff and speakers and all this stuff. I don't know how you can be splendid. One one wrecks me for a month. It it does take a little stamina. Um it does. I was at Tucson last week at the Festival of Books and did uh four events in two days and two of which I was moderating. So <laughs> my yeah. eyes were fucking out by then. But it was great. It was such a great that was a great festival. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, yeah, no, they're they're good. It's just they're very tiring. It's yeah. just uh, you know maybe the older I get, the, the the longer I don't know. It just seems to take more. Traveling takes more out of me too nowadays. You know. Yeah, well, traveling is just it takes out a lot out of all of us. I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, it's not it's not that much fun anymore. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I ever thought it was fun, and um, now it is considerably less fun. So. Um, I'm sure there are people that still enjoy it. I would prefer to teleport to wherever I want to be, and uh, that would be fun with me. <laughs> yeah, I close my eyes and click my heels three times. Yeah, no, invent that for me, and I'll be I'll be going all over the place. Yeah, yeah, I can't win. Well, speaking speaking of that, here's we've got a guest today. Of course, he's a superstar writer, New York Times bestselling, Washington Post number one, Amazon. I mean, he's done it all. You know, and uh, he's probably been to a fair share of book shows. So uh, here we got with us Mr. Robert Dugon- Dugoni. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I was listening in, and I'd have to agree with John. I'm, the The travel is starting to get a little old, so uh, it's great. It's great to be. It's great to travel. It's great to go meet people and talk to people, but. Once you start getting up a little bit in age, it's uh, it becomes a little bit of a chore. Yeah, it seems for me, it seems like when I get home, it takes me a couple of days to recover, (laughs) 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 which just seems silly. Like I just, I don't know, I don't know if you do what I do, but I tend to come home and take my suitcase and put it on the floor, and about a week later, I realize I still haven't unpacked, so I got to go do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just it's it's crazy because it used to be I I'd love I traveled all over the time flew and did everything and then now it's kind of you know if i if i plan two or three in a year that's that's <laughs> enough it's just um is that kind of do you still do a lot of these events or are you still really uh, geared up to go and and do events or do you have you slowed down on that yourself um i've slowed down a little bit but um I, you know i'll be perfectly honest um and you know uh i'll not not to blow smoke up you know anybody but um I just I feel like if people have taken the time to read something that I wrote, to read my book, and it's a very humbling experience to have somebody call you up and say, hey, we would love for you to come and talk to our friends of library. We're trying to raise funds. I just did that in Florida. I'm going to do it back in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. I, that, that's kind of hard to say no to. You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's flattering. And as I said, it's humbling. And so for me, um, I do really do my best to try to – you know, do a lot of uh, um, book clubs um, on Zoom, in person, uh, it, it, library events, you know, anybody that, that wants to have me. Have you, have you, do you find that it's changed since the, uh, you know, the onset of social media and stuff? Do you find it's different for you? Do you, do you find it um, 
um, better or, or, or worse? You know, it's changed very much so. And, and I guess better or worse is how you look at it, right? Um, I think I did 70 book clubs in the last two years, something, something like that, two, maybe two and a half years. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Because I didn't have to leave my my home. I mean, I did them by Zoom. I did them all over the world. I did a book club in India, a book club in um, Spain, a book club in um, Paris. Uh, and, and you know, I, don't get me wrong. I would love to go to any of those places. Yeah. But nobody's gonna, you know, nobody's gonna pay my way to go to a, just to go to a book club. But um, so it was great. It was terrific that I got to meet these people. I got to talk to these people. I got to do all these wonderful things. But I didn't have to leave my home. I could I could go out and play nine holes of golf, or my wife and I could go to dinner, and I could still do all these things. Uh, the bad side is, yeah, you know, you there's something about doing events in person and meeting people that you've been talking to for three or four months. You know, getting things set up that um, that that I I do miss. But I, I as I said, I'm starting to do that more again because of the, you know, COVID is is kind of weaning. It's over if you will. And so um, it's nice to get out and, and to meet people again in person. How, how much did you have to change in order to um, start doing more of the online presence? Because, you know, for writers, the last 10 years, it's really, really gone. You know, it's it's all about, uh, you know, Facebook and social media and TikTok and all these things like that. So there's a lot of presence and you have to put a lot of time into that. Do you did you have you adapted to that really easily, or is this still something in process? Well, I I wouldn't say really easily, but I I definitely have adapted to it. So, for instance, you know, I do my social media stuff usually when I'm sitting at, at watching the television, you know, or or something like that. I still do. Uh, I still answer my emails. I still answer my social media. And again, it kind of goes back to that my my belief that if somebody is taking the time to write me, uh, whether it's Facebook or, or, or um, Twitter or Instagram, you know, because they read my book and it, it meant something to them, then I feel that I owe them a personal response. Um, so, I, so I've always kind of done that from, from the very start. Uh, that, that hasn't changed much at all. Um, I have become smarter about posting um, I no longer post on sensitive issues. I don't even post blandly on sensitive issues because it doesn't matter what you say. There's always somebody out there that, that is just looking for a fight. <laughs> and, um, I, I'm not looking to fight with people. You know, uh, it's not, it's not, that's not my point on social media. I'm not out there trying to convince anybody to change their mind or anything like that. Uh, you know, I'm just out there, you know, trying to, publicize what I do and I have a new book coming out. A lot of people want me to let them know. So, you know, I, I stay away from the controversial topics. I learned my lesson. Yeah. And I, you know, one thing I think that's really true too, is that it's just such a, it's all about time management, you know, and you post on something that's going to cause a firestorm and you have to get involved or some, that's your time away from writing away from, you know, talking about books or reading or whatever. You know? Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I, that I do is um, I, you know, I have a, I have a standard email that will go out to people that are just looking for a fight. And the, <laughs> the standard email is just that, you know, I don't have time to read or respond to every email I receive, but I appreciate receiving theirs. And whenever I do that, they never, they never write me back ever. And that's simply because I've concluded they were just looking for a fight. And if I don't give them a fight, then they move on to the next person. Right. I just give them John's address and email and everything. <laughs> so hey, just, yeah, when, in, when in doubt, contact John. He'll take care of you. He'll Here, watch out. I might answer your uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Uh, so now your, your newest book, Her Deadly Game, um, Let's let's talk about that a little bit. So, how would you describe that book? What what's your basic premise in this book? I always try to challenge myself on the the story that I'm writing, do something a little bit differently. And so, this is really a puzzle book that's a legal thriller. Uh, and and it, it that's how I set out to write it. I wanted to create a, a book where the crime that takes place is very uncertain. Um, the police aren't aren't certain how it came about. Um, and uh, the the attorneys aren't, and it, everything sort of begins to reveal itself in in the legal trial. So, I wanted to have a um, a defense attorney that was vulnerable, 
but also incredibly uh, innovative and um, and um, instinctual, and that's why she's a a chess player because some of the best um, attorneys that I ever uh, practiced with and best trial attorneys were really good chess players as well. So, um, you know, I wanted a puzzle book. I wanted a book that had mystery in it that readers were trying to figure out who's telling the truth, who's not. Um, what are they trying to hide? What are they lying? Um, what is the puzzle behind, you know, how did this woman, how did this woman die? You know, what exactly happened? The facts don't seem to add up to the evidence. Uh, why not? Um, I just, I really just wanted a book that was fun. I wanted it to be a fun experience for the reader. And I wanted the reader, when they finally get to the end, they just had one of those aha moments like, oh, my God, I was thinking that, but I didn't know. Or I, I was or even, you know, I wasn't thinking that or, man, that surprised the heck out of me. Um, I, you know, I think the goal in, in, in any novel is, is for the, to evoke some emotion in the reader. It can be, uh, you know, it could be something that hits them deep inside of them, like The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell. Or it can be one of those books where the person gets done and they just had a good time. You, you, this is another time you 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 bring in Seattle. It's 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 based in Seattle. What's what's your um, attraction to Seattle? I live here now. Um, I I moved up here in um, 1999 uh, with my wife and my 18 month old son um, after I left the practice of law, and so I'm here. And um, the Pacific Northwest has really a, it's a very interesting place. Um, you know, there's a lot of, it's overcast, there's, it's gray, uh, you can have some rain, but you also have incredible beauty. Uh, I had a police officer tell me one time that, um, I, somebody had asked, you know, why does the Pacific Northwest West have more than its share of serial killers? And his response was because there's so many ways to, to, to get rid of bodies. <laughs> I mean, we have rivers up here. We have mountains. We have streams. We have bogs. We have the ocean. We have the bay. I mean, we, it's just, it's, it's, when I first moved up here and I looked at the mountains and I looked and went up skiing and I just saw, you know, miles and miles of green forest, I said to myself, you know what? Bigfoot could exist up here. It could be possible that Bigfoot really exists. <laughs> Yeah, it's a beautiful area. Beautiful, you know. I've, I've lived there a long time. It's a great area, you know. Um, and you know, it's a good place to run from the law, right? If you're a serial killer, it's, it seems to be. Yeah, you know, with, with, without a doubt. And um, it's it's a very interesting. Yeah, Seattle's a very interesting town. It's a small town that has grown exponentially in the last ten years, but still tries to think of themselves as a small town. And they're not anymore. They're, they're, they have big town problems and big town issues. And that's great for a thriller writer because you can kind of blend both worlds in. I had a police officer tell me one time, uh, when there's a murder in a small town, it affects everyone in that town in one way or another. So, um, you know, things can happen in Seattle and, and you feel like it's right next door, um, but it's really not. So how do you keep it fresh? Where do you get your ideas from? I need I need to I need some advice here because <laughs> no, do you do you like walk around like Queen Anne or Capitol Hill or something? And or, like, what what happens? Do you look for sort of something, or where does it come from? It, you know, it comes from a number of different places. Um, I had a gentleman call me up one time, not call me up. He sent me an email and said, "Hey, I'd really like to have coffee and talk to you." about uh, the book you wrote, The Jury Master. And, of course, my answer to that is always no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> and, and then, you know, he kind of was a little bit more uh, persistent. Um, and uh, we began to talk, and I looked him up, and it turns out that um, he's the only CIA officer uh, to be uh, acquitted of espionage. And so we started talking a little bit, and I said, you know, I don't really want to write your story, but would you help me on a book? Because I have this character named Charles Jenkins, and he's a former CIA officer, and I thought he might be great to bring back. And that's what that's what started the, the Charles Jenkins trilogy. Um, Tracy Crosswhite was um, uh, something that just came out of out of nowhere, really, the story. But then when I started sitting down with police officers, uh, and I was talking to this one officer in particular, he said to me, you know, you really ought to meet my girlfriend. And I said, OK, why? And he said, because she is Seattle's first female homicide detective. And then walked this woman who had blonde hair and blue eyes and was about five feet ten. And it was I was shocked because I'd already created the character and she looked exactly like the character I had created. Um, 
so, you know, sometimes it's a necessity. You know, I hit a, a stall, uh, sort of a stall in my career after I wrote the Davis Sloan legal thrillers and I needed a new one. And so that's why I started looking for ideas for a new character, Tracy Crosswhite, new things. Um, sometimes they're, they're, they're issues that have just been a part of me for a long time. Uh, Sam Hell uh, has a lot of um, uh, truth in it of my, my own life and growing up in us what was a small town at that time, Um, you know, and, and uh, the world played chess is that happened in the summer of my uh, high school senior year. I got a job on a construction crew with two Vietnam veterans and um, it was the summer of a lifetime. I mean, I learned more in that one summer than I probably learned anywhere else. So, you know, I'm usually just open to open to the potential, you know, open to what's out there um, and, and, and sort of what's, what strikes me. So, so what is it first, the story, the characters, or the setting? Like, how is it that you approach a story? I always approach a story with um, being very open-minded to what the characters are telling me. Now, having said that, I can tell you that I'm working on a story right now. It's a historical legal thriller. It takes place in 1933, so it's during Prohibition and during the Depression. And it's based on a true story, a, a trial that my wife's um, grandfather had. An uh, underworld figure killing a light heavyweight boxer in a nightclub. And uh, I thought I was going to tell the story from the perspective of the defense attorney. And as I sat down to write the book, I had this guy in my head that kept saying, no, 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 I'm going to be the guy, the person that tells you the story. Uh, I'm a reporter. I'm 20 years old. I got a job during the Depression. It's I, I need to keep this job. It's important to me. And this I just let this character continue to talk to me and continue to talk to me and you know, pretty soon he convinced me that that this was the person that was the right person to tell the story, um, an outsider that can sit in the in the gallery of the of the trial and watch what's going on. And um, so, you know, a lot of times the characters come first, and a lot of times the idea comes first. But I think the characters are really the most important thing. Um, I don't know who said it, but I heard someone say once, "A plot is just a plot." It's the characters that the people will become invested in. And I think that's, I think that's very intuitive. I think it's true. Um, you know, it's rare, I think, when you put a book down and you say, well, I really identify with that plot. Um, I think more, what's more likely that readers put a book down and, and they feel some um, affinity towards a particular character. But the setting must be um, key to you as well. I mean, because when you're basing something in Seattle in a place that you live now and you, you love a lot, um, are you writing it like a character in a sense? Absolutely. I think that's a really great way to put it is you have to, uh, I teach the the craft of writing and uh, that's one of the things that I, I tell my students is, you know, a setting is just a setting if you let it just be a setting. But if you want it to become alive and become a part of the book, um, then you you have to work at it. And it's it's not just the location it's what seasons is it? And up here in Seattle and, and, uh, you know, back East in particular, um, you know, or, or even California. I mean, you know, if you wrote a book that took place in Tahoe, uh, South Lake Tahoe in California, uh, this past winter, boy, you'd have a hell of a book because the snow up there is a, is a once in what, once in 100 years, the, 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 the amount of snow they've received and the damage it's going to cause and is causing then, you know, the, the season becomes a character in the book. So um, here in the Northwest, you know, you, we have a lot of rain. We can have snow. Um, there's just a lot of things that can really help you ratchet up the tension in your book. You know, rather than just having two characters sitting and talking, maybe they're sitting and talking in a thunderstorm, you know, and they, they don't know, they, can, they can't hear one another well enough. And one person is yelling to the other person, there's a guy with a knife standing right behind you. The reader reads it, but the person doesn't hear it because that's just when a thunderclap took place, right? So there's just a lot of things you can do with your setting that really um, can accentuate uh, your story. So, so you said something about you know the character talking to you. <laughs> so explain your relationship with your characters, or do you just hear voices, or what what goes on with you? Um, my characters become <laughs> very. This sounds terrible, but my characters become very close to me um i i really when i get by the time i get done reading a book or by the time i get done writing a book and writing all the different drafts i'm really sick and tired of them but then after it's like you know like your kids when they you know just keep annoying you annoying you and you just but then afterwards um i just i i 
they just mean so much to me that I, you know, you, you, you begin to, people say, you know, you writers think of their books like babies. Well, I, I have two children, so I don't think of them that closely as babies, but I know what they're, what they're talking about is um, um, you become very close to your character because you spend so much time with them, um, you know, concerted time with them. Uh, if you know, if you put out a book a year, you're spending 12 months with them. Um, I might spend three, four or five months with, with a character every day, every single day I'm creating this human being, this person, or I'm allowing them to at least create themselves. So, um, I don't know about other writers, but I do become very close to my, to my, um, my characters. And it's really nice when I get an email from a reader who says something like that, who said, when I closed the book, I missed them. I missed those characters. Um, that's really special. You know, um, you write for the perspective of a lot of female characters, which is, um, you know, I, I also do this. It's a little bit unusual. <laughs> and can you say something about why you choose to do that or what inspired you to write from female perspectives? Yeah, I mean, the, the, here's the deal is people ask me all the time. They'll say, how do you write from the perspective of a woman? And I always say, I don't. I say, I, I think that would be a fatal mistake for me to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to be a woman now and I'm going to write. I, I don't do that. Um, I don't think that there's that much dissimilarity between um, men and women on some of the very basic issues. Uh, we, we all, I think, want the same thing. We want to be respected. We want to be respected in what we do for a living. We want to be taken seriously. Um, we don't want to be taken advantage of. Um, we don't want the people we love to be hurt. Um, we all have skeletons in our closet. They can be, you know, skeletons uh, based upon the family we grew up in. They can be our own skeletons that are, our, are of our own doing, our own stupidity. Um, and so I think there's a lot more similarity between uh, the sexes than there is dissimilarity. And I think that's what people identify with is they say, wow, you know, this, this character is, suffers from anxiety or this character is suffering from PTSD um, you know, this character is, is trying to sol solve a homicide. And meanwhile, her 18 month old, you know, daughter has an earache and is crying all night long. There's, I just think, I think that I, I just try to write from the perspective of a person that has been damaged, that has skeletons in her closet or his closet that they're trying to deal with while also trying to get through life. Yeah. I mean, I think that really finding sort of the common humanity, at least I've found is what, what is, you know, I, the thing that links us all in a lot of ways and characters, because then you want, you know, that they make them particularly identifiable to whatever reader might be reading them in your writing. I'm curious, cause I'm always struggling a little bit personally with, you know, where you begin a story with a plot or with, uh, a, an outline, I guess, or, um, or do you sort of write into it, write into character? You've mentioned that character is, of course, it's chiefly important. Um, what, what is your, what sort of angle do you take on that? I had a, um, I had a, a sort of a mentor at my agency, um, Don Cleary. He used to love to read my books. Uh, he was actually the accountant back there, the finance guy. And he used to say to me, start 40 pages later and end 40 pages earlier. <laughs> and I say, okay, because I think we all as writers have a tendency to write our way into stories and write our way out of stories. And that's really not what the parts that the readers want to read. The readers want to read the, the story that begins with action and ends with action, right? So um, I try to drop the reader right into the story right away um, so that they become immersed in it right away, that there's something going on immediately. And then when the story ends, I try to end it, right? I just let it end it. I don't, I don't try to spend a lot of time trying to uh, explain um, different things. So, you know, for me, the, the, the process is really in all, all in the editing, which I'm, I'm sure it is for you and for most writers. Um, that first draft, you know, we're just spitting it out. We're just trying to get it out. You know, what is it, what is it in my head that I'm, that I'm trying to say here? Why are these characters talking to me? What is it they have to say? And um, we're trying to, you know, do that. Um, and, and then once we get it out on paper, that's when we have an opportunity to say, OK, you know what? Let me go back and look at this now. What exactly do I have here? What exactly did I write about? You know, I thought I was writing about redemption, but maybe I was writing about revenge. Um, I thought I was, you know, writing about bullying. But, you know, maybe I'm writing about, you know, overcoming bullying, which is not the, quite the same thing. Just those little things, John, that, you know, I think we as writers have to sort of know what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. And um, 
you know, what I do is I just try to get the book out. Um, I'm not really focused terribly on too much of the intricate details that though, that's more of the stuff that comes in later. I kind of think of it as an impressionist painter, you know, um, they don't start with a little black dot and then, you know, you step back and you realize it's not a black dot as you move forward. It's actually an umbrella. Um, but when you're standing, you know, uh, when you're standing that close, anyway, my, my point is that I think you start with a canvas and you put a swatch of color down on the canvas and then you put another swatch down and you put in a, and suddenly things start to become clearer and clearer as you begin to put the painting together until finally at the end, you're really putting those fine little strokes in. And that's what I try to do. Those fine strokes being what are the little things that this, that this character has that makes them believable, makes them real, but still they're a little bit larger than life. Um, there's somebody that the reader can, can get behind and, uh, and believe in, but they're still real. They're not superhuman. Um, and those are, the, those are the little things that often come for me after I sort of have a story hashed out. Now, you mentioned that you're writing historical fiction right now. Um, and I'm curious, I, I write historical uh, myself, but I've written, of course, some contemporary. Um, how do you find it from a research standpoint that has changed? Clearly, you're doing research for all your novels, but does it, is it different kinds of research? Do you find it more difficult or more interesting? Um, what, what do you think? Well, I, um, I am a research nerd. Um, I love research. Uh, you know, as you know, um, our scenes often come out of our research, right? We're doing, we're doing research, for instance, when I was doing a lot of research on the Vietnam War. And I, I'll read a particular scene and I'll say, that's going to be a scene in my book. You know, I, I, uh, the, just the, whatever that incident was, that research, that's, that's something that's poignant to what I am trying to write. So I, uh, you know, like most of us authors, um, we, I, I tend to over research and I have to like basically slap myself, you know, and say, stop it. You know, it's time to write the novel. Um, but I, I love, I love the research and I, and I love, um, I love learning about things that I didn't really know about. Um, I'm, I, by no means do I ever get done and say I'm an authority on any subject because I realize I probably just, you know, cracked the tip of the iceberg. Um, but I always really admire, um, like, um, George R. R. Martin that wrote Game of Thrones. I mean, you know, did he, did he do all his own research? Did he have research? done for him i mean how does he know that in in that time people didn't wear shoes they wore these things or they didn't wear you know uh underwear they wore this you know what i mean all those intricate details um of of you know people living in that particular time is um it's a, it's amazing to me um what you guys do as as writing historical novels i i just i have i have great admiration for you because it it's it's got to be so hard to get the little intricate details right. And you know, if you don't, somebody out there is going to call you on it. Oh, indeed. Yeah, it's really <laughs> interesting. Yeah, it's so funny because there is like the, there are these like levels of research. Um, I feel like that you like you were mentioning sort of the way you think about storing a story with a bright, like a, a, a real sort of broad sweep. And I feel like that's the that's the fun part. What's well, all fun, but then there's like the minutia that you have to get right. Like, like I was researching when silly putty was invented. You know, <laughs> I was like, you know, who knew I would be researching when silly putty was invented? But I think there is that aspect to historical. Um, well, with with uh, you know George R. R. Martin, I just he, it feels like he needs to continue to research his own world. It's so extensive, like to keep track of all that. You have to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, absolutely, and then. You know, people that people that said it in, you know, 17th century, you know, Ireland, you know, then they go back and they and they visit. And I, I mean, I just it, it, those books, I, I don't I don't know that readers really appreciate how much effort goes into into writing some of those those stories and, and, and getting it right. And I think that's the other thing that readers don't always appreciate is that we writers really do try to get it right. Um, you know, we're not trying to get it wrong. And so when I get an email from a gun expert who says, you know, they didn't have a Glock on that weapon in 1982. It's like, okay, I, I did my best. I have a gun expert. We got it wrong. Um, but you know, a lot of people take it personally. So, you know, we do, we do our best. Um, but obviously, you know, 
you 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 don't live in the historical times you write about and and I certainly didn't live during or I did live during but I didn't serve in the Vietnam War and uh I didn't live during 1933 which is a book I'm working on now um so I'm doing the best I can how do you um approach writing an evil or the bad character in your book one that causes all the chaos and do you have the same type of relationship like when you say that you know, like how how you have a close relationship and and hear the voices of your of your characters, is it the same for the for the bad ones? No, it's it's not. And in fact, I don't really like to delve too deeply into the darkness. I've written two books that had serial killers. The first one in um, in the, the the Tracy Crosby book, Her Final Breath. He was a bad guy, but what he did was bad. But there was an explanation for it. So. I tend to write people that do bad things but aren't necessarily bad people. They're people who are victims of their circumstances um, more than anything else. It certainly doesn't justify what they did. But I think one of the truly horrifying things about the murders of the four students in um, at uh, Moscow, Idaho, is that more and more it's beginning to in- look like this guy just wanted to murder four people, wanted to see if he could get away with it. And so he went and he ended four lives. And that to me is the kind of evil that I just, I, I can't, I don't even want to write about. I don't want to write about it. I don't want to think about it. Um, it's a darkness that is so foreign to me that it's, um, it's troubling. And I think it is for most people. You know, I know I have some books out there that, you know, have some darkness in them. But it's really not something that that I try, that I want to gravitate to or spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, it's just it's a part of the human experience that um, is is just not where I want to go. Do you like writing series um, better than standalones, or and do you, do you have kind of a a system like uh, I know some writers keep like what they call a bible or a, some sort of an overview book or. Um, way of keeping track of, of the characters and what goes on with them? Or do, do you not do that? Um, so one is I, I do write like, I do like writing series because what I have learned in writing series is that I get to know all the characters really well. You know, in the Tracy Crosswhite uh, books, I get to know Tracy. I get to know Kins. I get to know uh, Vic Fazio. I get to know Dell. And, and what I try to do is like you see in a television series, one episode may focus on one particular character. So I might have one novel that focuses more on Dell than on, you know, Dell with Tracy rather than some of the others. So I, I really enjoy it um, very much. I am so spoiled and so lucky. Um, I have a publisher that creates the Bible for me. And every time I write a new Tracy book, they update the Bible. So I know what kind of car she's driving, what color it is, um, you know, all those little intimate details um, I have that, I have that ability to, to get them right. So that's a, a blessing and a curse, right? Um, because if I get them wrong, it's nobody's fault, but my own. That's funny. That's, that's nice. Nice that you have that. Someone doing that. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah, it is a great, it's a great time saver and, um, it's, yeah, it's terrific. And I, I know some authors that have written Bibles for other, for, for other authors, Um, I know a guy that's done, he's a, he's a former librarian and so he's very good at it. And so he's, he did the actual Bible on, um, Star Trek series, you know, so that, you know, talk about difficult. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's nice to have that, that, um, that benefit at at my fingertips. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Give me some names and numbers. (laughs) (laughs) I was just, I was just like going back to my first novel, uh, the one I'm writing out right now as a follow up to it, like, you know, doing search find. (laughs) It is, you know, you never, you have to have those consistencies correct or you're. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do the same thing, you know, or the, the other one that kills me is I'll, I'll turn a book in and my developmental editor will say, you know, you got five people whose names start with M. Can you change one of the last names? And then you got to do a find replace. And of course, you know, it never, it never works out perfectly, you know, and, and it, you know, it might be like the, the, the word might be, you know, Tom, and you don't realize that Tom is also the first, first part of, you know, 
all these other words that you've written and you go back and start reading your manuscript and you've put, you know, Bill in all over the place. So um, I've had that, I've had that same, that same uh, thing with the find and replace. Do you ever, do you ever put like a, um, uh, a subtext or a meaning? Like when, when someone picks up your book and read, reads it at the end of it, is it just purely entertainment or is there some sort of a meaning or something that you want them to get out of the book, even if it came organically and you didn't plan it. Yeah, I, I mean that happens all the time. I, I don't I don't plan it. You're you're right about that, Al. I, I, I don't plan it because um you know I'm not going to sit there and try to preach to people. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to get up on on a soapbox and say you know this is the way things are, the way they should be. Um, and even when you try to do that with just a character, you alienate a, a great deal of people. So I never I never set out to write a theme. I never set out to write you know, something, but, um, one almost always develops right in our novels. They almost all, something almost always develops. Um, a, a theme will develop, um, in, in it. And, uh, you know, I let people kind of pick what it means to them. Um, and so I'll get emails from people saying, you know, the book meant so much to me because of X, Y, and Z. And it might not even be something that I, that I specifically thought of, but if it meant something to them, then that's great. Um, you know, that, that's terrific. I just, for me, I, I feel like it's a mistake if I, if I say I'm, I'm going to write a book about gun control or I'm going to write a book about, you know, abortion. Um, it's just, I, I just feel like I never write as good a story as if I just write, you know, I, I write about characters. Yeah, because that's, you're writing about characters or people going through things, then, then the reader can take it as it is from their feelings rather than you telling them yeah i think that's better um what makes a good book for you a character that i can relate to um you know i just i just read stephen king's fairy tale and i can't say that i necessarily related to charlie i'm I'm not six four and 240 pounds and i didn't play high school football but just that that inner struggle that that he's dealing with and i think i think that's the thing that that king does so well um, is he gives you a character and lets you relate to them and then puts them in a situation that, uh, you know, is, is fantastical, but you believe it because you, you be, you've become invested in, in the character, uh, and who the character is. Um, so for me, I think a, a book becomes something that stick, books that stick with me are usually characters that stick with me. Um, you know, the, probably the best example I can give is, um, I was, I think, 30 years old. Uh, I had been in a long-term relationship with a, a young woman. I thought I'd probably marry her after six years. And, um, we had broken up, uh, kind of moved in different directions. And I read Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. And when Captain Call came home to Lonesome Dove alone, and he'd lost all those great friends that you had met along the way, you know, Pee Wee and Gus and everybody else. And he was just sitting there on his porch all alone by himself. I mean, that just hit me right in the gut because that's how I felt at that time. And I can remember closing the book at, you know, midnight and weeping um, because the, the book just meant so much to me. And I think I think that's what good books are about. It's it's about characters that we can relate to that have some personal connection to to us. What was that author's name, Stephen King? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> little, known, little known author, Stephen King. <laughs> you know, a question I have is, you know, have you in your process of writing, um, you know, really had a moment that you felt like really overturned a project or really was a huge surprise to you? Something... Um, that ch- really changed the direction of a book. Um, maybe you had to rewrite it. Maybe you had to rethink it. Maybe it wasn't that involved. I don't know, but something that really, you know, moved you in a different direction in the process. Um, yeah. I mean, not, not, not to make, not to make this, this sound, um, uh, trivial or anything like that, but uh, almost every book, it really, um, because I do write organically. And so almost, almost in every book, there's always something that will surprise me. Um, you know, one of the good examples I can give is, um, I, uh, I was writing the book, um, uh, Charles Jenkins, this, one of the books in the Charles Jenkins series. And 
He's uh, he's in this FSB agent's apartment. They they have to become allies, even though they're enemies, and they're bored to tears because they're basically in hiding. And uh, Victor Fedorov is the guy's name, and he says, "You want to play chess?" And Charles Jenkins, who's the protagonist, says, "Yeah, I'll play chess with you." And they start to play these chess games, and it suddenly becomes apparent to Jenkins that uh, Fedorov is a very, very good chess player. And uh, because he lets Charlie kind of win the first few games, and he says, why don't we play for some money to make it interesting? And then he just sort of kicks Charlie's ass. And, you know, the whole time that I'm that I'm writing this, I'm thinking, what the hell does this have to do with the story? What, I mean, what, what, what point does this have to do with the story? But I've done this enough to go, you know what, I'm just going to gonna write the process out. If I have to cut the scenes, I'll just cut the scenes. Um, and then suddenly later on in the book, uh, Fedorov comes to a point where he's not going to get the money that they thought they were going to get. And he's you know, telling Charlie that he's going to leave. He's going to quit. And Charlie says, I know you're not going to leave. I know you're not going to quit because it's not about the money for you. It's about it's about the win- it's about winning and you want to win. And it suddenly dawned on me. That was the reason for writing the chess scenes is, you know, Fedorov just wants to beat him. He just wants to win. Um, but I didn't realize that at the time I was writing those scenes. So a lot of times I just sort of have to that trust that inner voice, that muse, that, that there's a reason for what I'm doing. And I, that's what I tell you know, a lot of my students is, is I just say, uh, that first draft, don't self-edit yourself. Just let it come. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? It's a word processor. You know, you can move chunks of material around. You can take them out. You can put them in. You can, you know, you can do all kinds of things. This isn't like the old days when we're, you know, typing on the Gutenberg press and, you know, you make one mistake and you, you want to hang yourself because it's going to change the whole story. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I kind of am surprised at almost every book I write. Um, and to me, that's one of the, that's one of the real, um, thrills of writing. That's one of the joys of writing is those aha moments that we have, right? When something happens and you go, Oh my God, that's, that's why I did that. That's why I was doing that. Um, to me, that's really the fun part of it. Yeah. It's so interesting. I think that it, what they say is true. You, su- you surprise the author, you surprise the, the, the reader, you know, um, it, it's certainly a very, it's a it's a very fun moment when you discover you have your own aha moment and then and then you realize all the editing you have to do to make it work, but but you're like committed to it, right? Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you have that moment of oh my god, I have to go back and change this. But um, if you're doing it because you know it's going to make it a better book, I, you know you probably get the same thing I get on my developmental edits. You know, my developmental editor, and I'm a big believer in letting people do their job. And so, you know, my developmental editor is really good and we have a really good relationship. But there'll be some times where she makes a, a she, she'll give me a suggestion on making a change and I realize how much work that's going to be. And, you know, I just sit there and fume for like hours and hours. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And then I go away and I come back the next day and I read the paragraph again and I go, yeah, she's right. I need to do it. But, you know, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I think you always have to take a break after reading, uh, you know, developmental editor feedback um it's just i can't imagine reading it and then jumping in immediately (laughs) yeah no i do i do the same thing i print the letter out i read it very thoroughly i go back and i highlight it i number the different things that she wants me to do and how to do it then i walk away from it i go out on the golf course and i do something fun for a while and i come back and i look at it again and i go okay yep she's right and you know it's the other thing is it's been sort of a, a proven method for me. Um, She and I have worked together on 13 or 14 books now, maybe more, and we've had success. So obviously, you know, there's a, there's a team effort here. And I think, I think, I think too often we writers can get, can get too um, possessive of our stories. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I think writing is a, is a, it's a very solitary process, but I, I also think it's, it's a, it's a group process. It's a team process. And now that's not to say that if you don't have a good editor, you know, you want to be list. I've, I've had a couple editors where I suddenly realized, you know, one, one editor in the David Sloan series said to me, um, you need to get rid of his wife. And I said, why? And she said, because married sex is boring sex. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like an idiot, I, I didn't have many books under my belt. I listened to her, and the, probably one of the biggest mistakes I made was killing off 
David Sloan's wife. I mean, I could have, I could have had much more tension in the book by keeping her alive. It's so funny when I, w- I w- interviewed John Sanford and Bob Crace at the Tucson Festival, and I think Bob was mentioning someone telling him to do the exact same thing, although I don't think he did. I'm pretty sure he didn't do it. And so um, it seems to be this common, like, s- s- bit of advice to kill off the wives. Um, <laughs> it's a little strange. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I guess I get it, but... <laughs> It is. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever been. To, have you been to the Tucson Festival of Books? It's. I used to go. I was kind of a regular down there, and uh, I've gotten away from it. I've always, but wow, it's a. It's really a tremendous experience, and they've done a, just a really great job raising raising money for that community down there. Oh, it's amazing! It's huge, and I didn't realize they have only one paid employee. That it's all volunteer. Which, when you understand that and understand what an undertaking it is, it's pretty impressive. I, it was my first yeah. time, so I, I was just uh, seeing it for the first. Um, but I, I think uh, it's yeah, it's a wonderful festival, um, and lots of people turn out for it. So great, great crowd. Yeah, and the good weather. <laughs> well, at least I had good weather. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, so speaking of, I have a question I asked actually at the to, at another panel, and I'm just curious about it because I think I'm trying to, in some ways, work through it myself. But um, you know, representations of violence on the page, like, do you? I, I was at this panel and I had three different authors, and they, after reading their books and looking at their work, I thought they all describe and and interface with violence differently. Like one. Uh, one of them really kind of has it off the page. One of them is very sort of clinical, and the other one's like incredibly descriptive and metaphorical, and for lack of a better word, kind of juicy. Um, and I thought, you know, how do we how do we go about putting violence on the page? Do you think much about that when you're writing violence in your books? Um, oh, absolutely. I, I think I think you have to. Um, I think you have to be. You have to understand who your audience is. Um, you know, most writers' audience are middle-aged women. Uh, and there's a couple of things that middle-aged women aren't really interested in reading. Uh, one is the swear words, especially the F word. Uh, and the other is violence. And uh, ironically, the third thing is um, uh, they don't want to read sex scenes unless they're reading a romance novel. I mean, if they're reading a romance novel, boy, you give them as much sex as you want. But if they're reading a mystery and a thriller, it seems gratuitous to them. At least that's been my experience. And so I kind of I kind of go by the old adage that you know my mother uh, gave me, which is fade to black. And so um, you know I think if you say he came at her with a knife, and then your next scene is you know Detective Hargrove looked at the body laying on the ground. Oh, okay, you know he, people know what happened. Uh, and I think the other thing is you know it, it, from my personal experience is I can't write as well as people can. Uh, visualize in their own mind um, those those types of scenes. And so I think sometimes when you fade to black, it's even more gruesome because it becomes a white space on the page that the reader fills in. And the reader fills it in with their own horrific, you know, fear, if you will, of what, what could possibly have happened. Um, I've always told people I'm claustrophobic. So if, you know, somebody really wanted to, to you know, do something, you know, bury me alive in the ground, you know, which Tess Garrison has in one of her books. And, uh, I mean, it's just chilling to me, absolutely chilling on, 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 on that horrible experience. So sometimes it's better to leave things to the reader's imagination because we can't write it as well as they can imagine it. Yeah, it's like what uh, good Hitchcock say the most terrifying thing was like a, a, a closed door or something. The idea being is that, like, you know, don't – the less you show, the more you're – terrified <laughs> like sex and marriage <laughs> <laughs> terrifying, <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> how, how do you think each book uh you write and complete changes you you know that's a good question i don't know that anybody's ever asked me that question before um i don't really know that i that i know what that what that answer is um this is going to sound this is going to sound sort of ridiculous but I think as I've gotten older and I've written stories, I've come to appreciate my own life all the more. I've come to appreciate that um, I have really a good life. Uh, I have a good wife. I have good kids. Um, nothing bad has happened to any of them, knock on wood. Um, 
my life has has not been without its trials and tribulations, but certainly not the trials and tribulations that I give my characters. So I think in some respects, um, what I learned from my stories is how fortunate I am, um, how blessed I am. And I, it, yeah, I, I, I think that would, I think if, if, yeah, I think that's probably the best answer that I would, that I would have for that question. Not, not really, like I said, not really having, I don't think I've ever answered that question before. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, listen, social media, are you a big social media guy? Do you have a website? Where do people find Robert? Yeah, I have a website. It's uh, robertcagonibooks.com. Uh, you can also find me on Amazon, which is, um, Amazon books slash Robert Dagoni. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like, uh, if, if people are going to take the time to, to write to me, I do my best to answer them. Um, I think that's the kind of a polite thing to do. Um, and you know, but you're going to, you're also going to get some oh my. emails. We all do. And, you know, you just, you know, it just comes with the territory. So, yeah, I, I, I am on social media and, and I do have a web page and, and people can find me all over those places. Are you dancing on TikTok yet or? I, I am not. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm fearful of TikTok. I, what you read is like, you know, I, are, is it a Chinese thing? Is it not a Chinese thing? I mean, you know, are they, are they looking at, you know, my bank account and I don't know it? So I just decided to stay off it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I guess that's all. So, so what's next? What's coming up next? For you? Oh, you know, really, some great projects. This book, this book, her deadly game, will be out March twenty eighth, and then the next uh, Tracy book, One Last Kill, will be out in the summer of twenty twenty three. And then I have two historical novels that are going to be coming out. Um, one is the nineteen thirty three uh, true tri trial that took place in Seattle in nineteen thirty three. So during um, Prohibition and, uh, and, and during the Great Depression, uh, I'm really excited about that, that book. Um, and then um, I was asked by, by two, two men who uh, did some tremendous research on, on a story that took place in World War II that's never really been told. And they just, they just couldn't get the book written the way that it needed to be written. And they asked me if I would be willing to do it. And I just had so much, um, I'm so impressed by both of these men. I don't normally do this, but um, I said I would. Uh, and that book's called Hold Strong, and that'll probably be out, I think, in 2024. So um, really just have some great projects that I've been working on. I'm really excited about. Wow. Fantastic. It's been, it's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, latest book, of course, is called Her Deadly Game, and our guest is the author of that and many, many more books. So look them up. It's uh, Robert uh, Dugoni. Thank you for, for being here. Al, thanks very much. John, thank you as well. I, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm honored to have been on, so thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.